But I want to encourage you, <clears throat> as we start off tonight, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to, I'm always, ever since I've been teaching this class, last semester and this semester, I am looking for more material all the time on how to become a better preacher. And what's interesting about this is the fact that um, I came across a, a, a book today, interestingly enough, that kind of goes back to some of the things I was talking about earlier. And the name of the book is Why Johnny Can't Preach. The media have shaped the messengers. Now, this particular guy is not a member of the church. He's writing from another uh, denominational perspective, so we need to understand that. But he does make some points in the preface that I want to bring out and maybe encourage you to think about. It. Maybe go read, go ahead and buy it and read it uh, for a Kindle. If you get it on your Kindle, it's only seven dollars, and it might. And again, I just want you uh, want you to understand that I. Uh, do not approve of everything he's going to say through here because of the background he's coming from. But as we think about trying to be better preachers, it doesn't hurt for us to get other viewpoints that might help us to understand what's going on here. So with that in mind, I want to just start off uh, with a word of prayer. And then we'll, I'm going to go over some of the things he says just in the preface of this book that might help us to think about our own preaching and what we need to be doing. Because again, we've got the, we've got the message in the world, the best message in the world. And we need to make sure that we are, you know, being the best speakers that we can be so that we can make a difference in people's lives. Amen. So, Amen. As we think about that, I'm willing to take any good advice from anybody in that respect um, where they might could see some things that that we've never or maybe don't think about in this respect. So uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Jim, would you lead us in that prayer? And then we will get started, okay? Jim W. or Jim Gentry? <laughs> <laughs> okay i've got to be you know specific. you know what I, I i i spoke so uh, i'll do it i'm happy okay to thank you it. brother okay thank you. all I right appreciate that. <clears throat> our great god and father we're so thankful for <laughs> your son and we're so thankful for the gift that he's given us we're so thankful for the plan of salvation father we're so thankful for our brother here that's teaching us from his experience and his knowledge to be able to teach us all how to become um better preachers of your word father we ask that you be with us this evening as we uh, delve into those things and, and try to learn how to truly preach the best message that there ever has been and ever will be. Father, we ask you to be with us, be with those that are not uh, able to be here. Um, hopefully those are, folks are safe. Father, we ask that um, your blessings upon us as we continue. It's Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's talk for a very brief moment in time. Some of the things he just says in the preface, the introduction of the book, I'm just going to hit a couple of things that he emphasized and, and stress this idea. He says, um, um, there will always be a subjective element in the assessment of preaching. Now, what does he mean by that? Everybody's going to look at a sermon a different way. Whenever you're preaching to people out there and you've got maybe, all right, let's suppose we have a hundred members there. Every one of them are going to hear it in a subjective viewpoint. They're going to be thinking about maybe, how does this apply to me? So, for example, if we preach the Mother's Day sermon on Mother's Day, of course, mothers would appreciate us preaching that on that particular day and talking about it. But what are the daddies going to hear? You know, well, if they just wait another month, maybe dads will hear about the Daddy's Day sermon. You know what I'm trying to say there in that respect. But in every situation that we're dealing with, we are having to realize that people are coming at it from different things going on in their lives as well as in other things. And so as they're looking at this, they may not be looking at everything you're saying or listening to everything you're saying objectively as much as they are judging what you're saying and trying to figure out how it's going to affect them. Uh, think about the ideal as we, there is that subjective element in preaching and everybody's going to look at it in a different sense. So think about the idea that a lot of times, whenever we don't have some sort of unity in our sermon, 
if there is a, a disconnect somewhere or another. A lot of times we may cause people to, well, let's be honest, their mind begins to wander, right? And then they try to come back to the sermon. And by this point, you've made a, another point that maybe they've missed, and now they can't keep up with anything from there on out. Um, one of the things he points out very clearly in this preface of this book, why Johnny can't preach, is he said, um, a lot of times as a result of that subjective idea, there is a disunity in preaching. So sometimes it may be that what we need to do is as we're preaching is go through that first point and kind of summarize everything, then kind of drag or bring them along or drag them along as it might be with those, um, uh, sentences or those, uh, words that, that emphasize I'm changing to another point and uh, try to bring out the idea through this. This is all getting back to the main point that I'm trying to say. He mentions the fact that a lot of sermons have no recognizable order to them. There's no apparent rationale for why the first point precedes the second. Or, you know, do we just, do we name, okay, here's the first thing I want you to get. Here's the second thing that I want you to get based upon the first thing. So he's making some points here in this book that are very interesting. Uh, in the fact that, again, a lot of times whenever we finish preaching, we're tired and we hope that we've given everybody what they need. But think about, again, the idea that a lot of times some people may walk out without having received anything. Now, it's not all the preacher's fault. Amen. Let me just emphasize that it is not all the preacher's fault. You don't know. And I think I have mentioned this before, the idea that sometimes they may be a family argument before they even get to church on the way up there. And they've got that in their mind the whole time. You don't know. It may be a situation where mothers and fathers are having a problems with a difficult child. So think the idea that what our job is, is to try to get all these people on the same page, listening to what's being said, trying to make the application to them in their lives from teenagers or even little children, even beyond that, all the way up to 60, 70 year old people. It's really a tough job. And a lot of people don't even begin to realize this. Think about the idea that if we don't have some continuity in our sermons, then we can automatically lose some people in the, in the respect. And again, we a lot of times we, we're not willing as preachers for people to be honest about our sermons. Uh, we always want to hear people to say, good job, good job, good job. But I think sometimes maybe as we're meeting everybody as they're going out, maybe we need to stop them and ask them a question. All right, you said that was a good job. What part of my sermon really was something that helped you today? Now, you see what we've done. Now we've engaged the congregation. Hopefully, we will see whether or not they were paying attention. And number three, maybe they'll say something along the line that's going to emphasize to us, okay, maybe I didn't get that point across like I needed to. Maybe I didn't really bring out the continuity in the lesson as it should have been that way. So you see, we we need to look at these things. We need to be willing to take some critique. And I'm not just saying, uh, asking people, well, how did you like the sermon? Just to get everybody to pat us on the back, though we do need that encouragement, right? But we need to have some people honest enough with us to help us to understand that whenever I can't or whenever I'm not doing my best job, then I need somebody to help me to see that so that I can be better. And so think about the idea that whenever I, we actually sometimes hear brothers or sisters says, well, I don't feel like I've been fed this morning. All right. Well, there's two things there. Number one, if you don't put out the feed, they're not going to be fed. Right. Number two, if they're not feeling well or something like that, they're not going to eat the food. So it's not always the preacher's fault. At the same time, our job is to get the food out there. And again, it needs to be something more than just 
sermons they may have heard or, or we regurgitate years after year after year about the church and so forth. And please don't get me wrong. We've got to preach sermons on the church. We've got to preach sermons on salvation. We've got to preach sermon on, on why we sing without an instrument. You know, we've got to do all of that. But there needs to be also at the same time, uh, we don't want to bore people out of their skulls where they're not listening anymore. When you start thinking about this, especially post-COVID, think about the idea, again, that a lot of people now have a lot of things on their mind. Am I going to get this disease? What about my job? What about my family that I love so very, very much? What if they've got it? How am I going to take care of my older parents? What about my younger children? You see, the world right now, and Satan has stirred it up, I think, to cause us to not focus on the word of God as much as we're getting focus on everything else. Amen. And so as we're looking at this, we've got to realize that again, we are there to feed them. We are there to give them lessons that would help them to walk out the door, not hopeless, but with joy in their hearts and, and grateful Gratefulness, because at least now, that's it. You know, at least he's given me something to work on. So, how many of you, let me ask you this question. How many of you, whenever you preach a sermon, think about this for just a minute. How many of you have a wonderful wife that helps you to show or see what you need to be better at? Raise your hands. Yes. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and again, now, sometimes we need to ask, you know, <clears throat> we can ask the question, well, what was my sermon about? And, you know, the wife might say, well, I'm not really sure. All right. Then, then, okay. Do you think that what I taught is based on what we actually studied? And a lot of sometimes they say, well, I, I don't know about that. You know what I'm saying? So the thing is, is we've got to realize that we're doing the job, but are we connecting? And again, think about the idea that the one person or the one group of people that we're probably going to connect with more than anybody else is our family because they love us as much as they do. Amen. So as we think about this, we have to think about the fact that we need to start making sure that we are giving it our very best and that we are connecting with everybody. Think about how this sermon might apply to the youngest member of the church. Okay. Right. And will they be listening to it? Think about how it's going to apply to the oldest member of the church. Think about how it's going to apply to the teenager. Think about how it's going to apply to the middle age. Think about how it's going to apply to somebody that's worried about losing their job. All of these things come into play. And you may be saying to yourself, well, Tommy, man, that becomes, that becomes just about impossible. Amen. <laughs> that's the job. That's what Jesus did. He was able to connect with everybody. So when we're trying to be like Jesus in that respect, we have to think about everybody as we're going through it. And again, what I've tried to do all through this a lot of times is to <clears throat> look at how it does apply in a lot of these situations. Now, I may have said these things before, and that's fine, and, and I want you to understand it. But again, the more we get this in our mind, the more we're thinking about the whole congregation, the more I think we're going to be able to connect. So having said that, Let's take a few minutes, if you will, and let me preach a lesson that I did uh, back a few years ago. I, I resurrected this lesson. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with resurrecting lessons. I think as Jesus went from place to place, he probably preached the same message time and time and time again, because there were different people in different situations that still needed to hear the gospel. There's nothing wrong with repeating a sermon. There's something wrong in it if we repeat a sermon without going back and restudying it. Amen. So as you're thinking about this, think about this in, in these respects. So we're going to talk about, <clears throat> for the next few minutes, 
But before I do that, is there anything you want to comment on what I've just said? I will take that as no. <laughs> well, I do have a question, Brother okay, Tommy. Go ahead, brother. So um, have you ever uh, either done through the quarter or maybe through the years said, you know what, what we'll do is uh, to feed the Bible classes will hit a topic this quarter. And then my sermons will reinforce that. Is that something that's done? Do, do you do you do that? Do you agree with that or, or not? Or what are I your thoughts think, about that? I think that anything we could do to get reinforcement of lessons taught, whether in the Bible class or wherever is better. I think I mentioned to you earlier this year, we actually started a series on finding Jesus through the Bible. Mm -hmm. And so up till now in January and February, we've gone through Genesis, Exodus, uh, last week I went through Leviticus this week, I'm going through numbers. And then the, you know, the next few weeks, we're going to go through Deuteronomy. We're going to go through it all. And yeah. And our Bible classes, some of them anyway, on Wednesday night. So mm -hmm. you see, you're, you're able to hear it that way. Uh, some of the Bible classes, I think in the adult class or on Sunday morning, they're listening to this as well. Uh, okay. and, and not only that, but we're actually getting different teachers, obviously, if I'm preaching and you've got a different teacher teaching it, they're going to see something that maybe I didn't and vice versa. So, yeah, I think it's good. I think it's what okay. needs to be happening. I think it's something that the churches need to plan more to do. And, okay. and again, that's going to depend a lot on um, if you don't have elders, you're going to have to get with the men. You're going to have to sit back and say, I'm going to need some help, guys. I, I need you to help me teach a Bible class on this. I want you to come up with some lessons that might help um, somebody. And let's think about it in this respect too. Do we, or do we not sometimes get tired of listening to the same person preaching over and over and over again? Mm. So we sometimes have gospel meetings. We sometimes have things like polishing the pulpit and things like that, which are good, which are good because brethren need to hear it from somebody else. I think anything we do to reinforce the message that's being preached is a good thing. And so, yeah, I would do all that I could to get with whoever's in charge of the Bible class, as well as the preacher and everybody else involved and actually get everybody involved as much as you possibly can in this and helping them to understand this is what we're going to be doing through this whole year. You can bog down. Uh, how many preachers have bogged down when they're preaching? We get in on a point and stay on that point, and we don't go on and use the transitional phrases from one point to the next. And so as a result of that, we're not bringing the church along with us as we're going through this. We kind of break abruptly and then go on and do something else, right? And so I think all that needs to come into play there. And that necessarily means, and this is what I like, this means working with elders. It means working with deacons. It means working with men. It gets more men involved. It gets more men in, in doing this. And, and I think that's what needs to happen in the church today. Because let's also be honest, a lot of preachers are quitting. What is a church going to do if the preacher quits? Are they going to be able to find a man? Who's going to take the place? Are we just going to close the doors? These are valid, real questions that we are answering because, again, we're seeing the church, a lot of churches shutter their doors right now. And, Tommy, how many congregations now, uh, if the preacher leaves, they might be able to find a man, but who can afford the man? Right. They've got congregations because they're getting smaller and smaller. They might find somebody, but can they afford it? And that's right. And that's a big question that comes into play there. It really does. So it's important to, to really look at all these things in, in all of this perspective and think about not just what's going on right now, though that's enough to think about, but we need to be thinking about the future. You know, Jesus in a lot of his teaching, he would always point to the fact of one day there's going to be a judgment day. Why does he do that? Because he emphasizes to all of us that what we're doing or failing to do is going to make a difference. So I need to make sure that I'm going to be ready whenever he does come, whenever that's going to be. So let me just encourage you to think about it in that respect. Get with the men of the congregation, the elders, whoever, 
and yeah, plan something out like that. You can bog down in it, but we've done it in such a way to where, uh, as I said, we cover Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Next week, we're going to cover numbers. That's starting in January, and now we're here, here we are in February. That's forcing us at the same time to do what? <clears throat> we can't stay long on one book. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we can't bog everything down to the point where people are going to be cross-eyed are we going to have to go through Leviticus again? You know, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say there. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so there's something to be said about that. And it forces us to continue to keep on working through it and go through again, the Bible in, in that respect. Now that's what we're doing. I'm not saying that anybody else has to mimic us or anything like that, but let me encourage you to think about it. And again, uh, if I haven't done it yet, I will get you to the South Cobb church of Christ web page and you can listen to some of the things we talked about see what you think by the way you can also listen to some of my sermons there i okay that's up to you i'm gonna leave that up to you all right <clears throat> so any other good questions here all right let me Brother uh, Pete, i <clears throat> yeah. just on tim's point a while ago i i I, I tried that one once where, but I think I did the reverse where I did a lesson in, in a sermon and um, because I wanted the the, the, the the feedback or the interaction from the audience, I, uh, I put it to them in a Bible class after um, a couple of days after I did it at a sermon mm -hmm. just to get that interaction. And that's a good thing. That's what we're talking about. So you see, that's kind of what we're doing. We're doing the sermon Sunday sermon, but we're also teaching it in the Sunday morning adult Bible class and Wednesday. So now after we've done that that day, then we'll pick up with the next book. Unless, you know, there's some books that's going to be a long book. So we're going to have to take a couple of weeks on it. But that's that's fine. We can't cover the entire book of Psalms in one lesson. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, come on now. You're good. You're really good. No, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> and I appreciate your, I appreciate your excitement and, and so forth, but uh, no brother. Well, no. <laughs> Tommy, Tommy, just tell him you're going, you're going to preach that day and you, you know, you're going to continue until midnight. We'll be done with the book of Psalms and, and you'll be good to go. Right. And if any of them fall asleep and fall down dead, I can't do nothing for them then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's take a minute or so. And um, let me let me do this. Let me take a quick break and see if anybody needs to come in here and get anything. Because when I get started, I don't want to have to stop for something. Okay. So give me just one second, a pause. And you might have the chance to go to the bathroom or something like that. I'm going to talk to this other class. If they want to get anything, they'll get it then. And, and then I'll come back and start. All right. Thanks. Okay. So we're going to preach or I'm going to talk this evening about moms in the Bible and what they teach us. Okay. So have you ever thought about the idea? Think about it. How a lot of times today, our mothers are often under attack by those who say that all of our problems in our lives are because of our upbringing. I think there was a time that, that we did bl blame our parents for the way we were raised, reared. And the thing is, is that sometimes as I look at the culture and as I look at what's going on, I know that there are a lot of children being reared by moms and dads who who really aren't doing the best job in the world. And it may very well be that it may be a generational thing because the earlier mo mother and father and the earlier mother and father, going back to grandma and great grandma and great, great grandma and great, great grandpa, all of those things uh, come down to us. And then slowly but surely, we think about trying to rear our children and bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And it's tough. And so sometimes we, it does us good to take a few minutes to talk about some of the mothers in the Bible and see what they teach us. So we're going to start off with the first mother in Genesis 2 through 4, a lady by the name of Eve. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, she is the mother of all living. 
But we also remember, and probably if we talk about Eve and under any circumstance, more often than not, we think about the garden situation, how she partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and gave it to her husband. Her husband did not do what the Lord wanted him to do and being the leader of the household, he took of that fruit and ate as well and sin came into the world. So here you have the mother of all living, but also <clears throat> the wife of Adam who brought sin into the world. Now, when sin came into the world, that started breaking relationships. It broke mankind's relationship with God. It broke or it definitely impaired uh, Eve's relationship with Adam, especially whenever you start to realize and become to grips with the fact of all the repercussions because of their failure to do what God wanted them to do. Because of this decision, sin came into the world, death, suffering, pain, and again, included in that would have to be the pain of childbearing. So as we go on and read through Genesis 2 through 4, we, we go a little bit further and we understand that she had two sons. And we remember that as she brought those two sons up, Abel was accepted by God for he did what he did by faith. <clears throat> Cain, however, the oldest, was self-willed. He wanted to do things his own way. And God warned Cain, much like he had warned his father Adam before this time. So the thing that we have to realize is we start thinking about this idea of mothers in the Bible is moms need to understand that every child can and will be different. They have their own personalities. And even though they are reared by the same parents, their lives can and will turn out differently. Sometimes <clears throat> parents will be disappointed in their children and in the life that they're living. Sometimes their children will decide that once they get out on their own, they can live their life whatever way they want to. And especially for Christian parents that have tried to bring their children up, Ephesians 6 verse 4, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, whenever their child goes into the world, children are going to break their heart. Imagine for a few moments, if you will, if you were in Adam and Eve's place. And perhaps you may very well have been there and you see the broken dead body of Abel. And now all of a sudden, you definitely now know what death is. Remember that God has said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. Now they know what death is. And then consider even more how <clears throat> their other son had actually killed Abel. How, how do you handle, how does parents handle, period? How does a mom handle the loss of a child? How does parents deal with the reality of their failure, perhaps, of not doing the very best that they can? And then those children go away from the Lord. Please don't misunderstand me. A lot of times children will rebel against their parents because of the fact that they feel like that their parents are too strict. But hopefully, as we try to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and again, think about how much moms have a play, role to play in that. We have to realize that we need to do all that we can while they're there at home to read the Bible to them, to show them how important living the life for God is to us. Children will see very quickly through our hypocrisy. Children will see very quickly if things are not fair, if we treat one child above another. Did Adam and Eve treat Cain differently or Ab than Abel? Because God was accepted or Abel was accepted by God? He did what he did by faith. Did his parents maybe like him a little bit more? So you see, as you start thinking about these things, there's a lot of things that come into play here. And again, especially as moms are the ones that a lot of times bring up our children or rear our children in a way to where they need to, it becomes a very big responsibility because a lot of times moms are there much, much more than dad is. 
So you have to ask the question, how do you handle it whenever your children go astray? One person told me years ago <clears throat> when we had our first child, they said, when children are little, they step on your toes. When they grow older, they're going to step on your heart. And how true that is. So I think, again, as we're trying to emphasize the ideal of how to bring breed our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, when we look at Eve, we see that the whole reason why we're in this situation is because of her choice. And then Adam's failure as a husband to do what he was supposed to do. And how that then affected Cain and Abel. And they felt like in a way that that's exactly what they, they were going to do, exactly what they wanted to do. And they had, as a result, to bury their son. But we're going a little further in Genesis 16. <clears throat> and also Genesis 21. And we see another family, Abraham. And we remember Abraham had a wife by the name of Sarah. But we got to remember the ideal and think about the idea that Sarah was barren for many, many years. So, and according to the customs probably of that time, Sarah thought, and here's a mother thinking what she thought God wanted, she thought God needed some help. And so she gave Abraham Hagar, her Egyptian slave. Abraham goes into Hagar and a child is born. And again, as you start reading that story, you remember how as this goes on, this starts setting up jealousy and strife in the family unit, and it caused Ishmael or Abraham to have to make tough decisions about his son Ishmael. Whenever later Sarah had the son Isaac, think about the idea that what Hagar did whenever Sarah sent her away and took Ishmael with her, how they went off into the wilderness and and. She, Hagar, was afraid of watching her son die, but God had spared Ishmael. Of course, it's interesting as well that the Ishmaelites later become a thorn in the flesh of the descendants of Isaac. Think about the idea how a lot of times mothers are looking out for their children and believe their children are always the best children. Sometimes mothers do have a tendency to spoil their children. Let's be honest, gentlemen, we do as well, right? We have our favorite son or favorite daughter or something along that line. No matter how hard we try, children know whether or not we show favoritism to their siblings or not. And a lot of times what creates problems in a family is when you have two or three or four children, you're going to have some that are always going to be thinking that you love somebody else more than them. And again, it's important that as we're trying to teach this to moms as well as dads and the entire family unit, think about the ideal of how you rear your children. Mothers are always looking out for the best of their children. They're going to defend their children no matter what anybody else says about them. But then when they get their children home, sometimes they may have to emphasize to them out and all that doing what you were supposed to do. But we go on a little further. In another story in the book of Genesis, <clears throat> a fellow, Rebecca and Jacob. Think about the idea now that Isaac is married to Rebecca. And rather than giving Isaac's blessing to the oldest son, that blessing that supposedly was supposed to mean so much to that family from that point forward, she tricked her own husband, Jacob, who by that time was very old and blessed Jacob as a result. Sometimes mothers have a problem with favoritism, and that's a source of problems in the family as well. What did Rebecca teach her son? She taught her son that to get ahead in life, you need to trick people and do things by the way of the world. And by the way, how often do we today try to do things by the way of the world? Our children, whenever they come in, grow up, or they're starting to grow up, they're fascinated by TV. They're fascinated by other things, and they're watching. And the TV, a lot of times, becomes the babysitter. And what happens is, is if mom and dad are not watching what is being taught to the baby at a very young age, 
it may very well affect that baby later on. Think about the idea that she, it was not surprising to us that Rebecca thought that she had to trick Jacob this way. And so she influenced her son this way because she had been reared with her brother, Laban. And remember that the Bible had talked about the fact on one occasion where Laban had tricked Jacob 10 times. She was just like her brother in so many ways. Moms, you're always teaching your children. We're teaching by our children bad things or good things. Dads, you also are teaching your children. The reality is we can never stop teaching. When you grow older and become a grandmother, a grandfather, you're still going to be teaching those children. Some of the best teachers we've ever had in our Bible school programs are mothers and grandmothers. And you see, this is the way the Bible brings out. We are supposed to, as parents, to bring our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And the thing that we need to understand is that that instruction begins at home. Hopefully, it's reinforced in the church so that now there is another support system to help our children to grow up and be the Christians they need to be. When we look at the world as it is today, the time that it, children spend in front of a television set or going to school, secular schools, they're being taught something totally different than what Bible and what the God wants and what we should be teaching them constantly. So, you know, above everything else, moms and dads, you need to be teaching your children the scriptures. But we go on to yet another example. <clears throat> a lady by the name of Deborah, Judges 4 and 5. She was called the mother of Israel. Deborah led at a time when there were, the men weren't stepping up to the plate. And sadly, that's often what happens in homes. Moms have to lead when dads are not doing what needs to be done. And so as you look at this, she was leading because the men weren't stepping up to the plate. They were facing a major leadership crisis at that time, and women had to fill the spot. How many, again, mom, moms have to be mom and dad both because dad's gone all the time. How many times do we, a lot of times, uh, not there to support our children? And by the way, whose responsibility is it to bring our children up? It's dad's responsibility. Is the family unit having to be where mom is both mom and dad? How many dads have faced up to the responsibility of bringing up their children spiritually? Men, we've got to step up and help our wives, the mother of our children, because they are our children as well. Think about how sometime <clears throat> this is now affecting the church. Because women are fulfilling or stepping into roles God meant for the men to fill, we now see this actually happening in churches of Christ, even, where women are stepping into roles that God meant for men to fill. Back a few years ago, there was a church of Christ in the area in Atlanta. After a year-long study, and it's always interesting that this happens this way, they decided that women can do whatever they wish. Why? Because a lot of the men didn't step up to the plate and do what they needed to do. So think about this. We've got to emphasize this and we've got to make it right. Think about Hannah and Samuel in 1 Samuel 1 and 2. She wanted to be a mother so badly that she dedicated her firstborn to the Lord. And Samuel learned that had God had to come first in his life. So think about the contrast with that when you have the contrast with Rebecca and Jacob earlier in Genesis chapter 27. You come to on a little bit further. And I could go on through all these stories. And by the way, I could preach entire sermons on every one of these. But then think about Elizabeth and Mary in Luke chapters 1 and 2. We remember that the mother of John the Baptist was Elizabeth. Jesus' mother was Mary. And here were two women who submitted to the will of God and became famous for what they did. And, you know, I, I read the context very closely in Luke chapter 1 and 2. 
Remember whenever Mary was told that she was going to have the child, Jesus, and she was a virgin before she even like went to tell her husband, she ran and talked to Mary or excuse me, to Elizabeth. And then think about Mary. What she had to say is she saw her son preaching and teaching and how the crowds were getting more and more angry with him. Think about how hard it was for her to see her son die on the cross. Did she really understand Jesus? Does any mother really understand their children to the point where they need to? But there's one thing you can see in Mary's case. She loved him with her whole heart. The closest we will ever see to God's love on earth is a mother's love for her children. She bore the Son of God in her womb. She endured the suspicion and the rumors of the family and the neighbors. What a burden. She brought forth this special child in the city of David and had to, bring, had to lay him in a manger. Blessed by Simeon and Anna in the temple. And hearing these two godly people, Simeon and Anna, talk about God's great role for this child. And then also being told up front that a sword is going to pierce your heart. Visited by the Magi with special gifts. Hearing of Herod's murderous intention and having to escape to Egypt. Did she buy into all of that? Did she, what, I mean, think about her in that situation. Think about her as she had to rely on other people to look after her children and find them undependable. Again, she watches him grow up. She watches him, in essence, leave the home. And she watches him as he does nothing but seemingly get everybody mad at him. And so again, whenever Jesus was in the temple, whenever he got old enough to go to the temple the first time, Luke chapter 2, verse 41 through 51, she has to go looking for him. And Jesus informs her that the first place that you should have looked would be in my father's house. So much to consider. Consider. It's interesting, again, in Luke chapter 2, that Mary... Mary treasured all these things in her heart. She was so torn. She was so torn between the privilege of parenting the Savior and the burden of the daily responsibilities of her role. So what are some things we can learn as we come to this? Mom's going to love you despite the fact that children sometimes break their hearts. Mothers are going to learn that children are always different. They need to look out for the best in their children and for their children. And moms, you need to always remember your teaching. Now I ask the question, what are you teaching? What are you teaching? Again, are we teaching what's right? Are we helping them to understand that? Moms need dads at home. So you need to do all that you can to make sure your marriage is what it needs to be. And mothers who love God constantly will be praying for their children and pray that they will be committed to the Lord. Moms, you have a great, awesome responsibility. Let God help you with it. Okay, gentlemen, that's it. <laughs> all right, now, give me, give me your thoughts on that. Everybody jump in all at once. Brother, I, I, I feel like I want to rewrite my sermon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> that was good. I like the way you, um, a matter of fact, initially, the sermon that I had initially, the one that I was drafting initially, I started out, um, looking at Adam and Eve and coming up, then I changed to the one that I 
I present and I gave you. Mm -hmm. Um, but I like how you you look at the different um models throughout the scripture and the 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 the, the advantage and disadvantage, and um you know you 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 you. I, I in my in my sermon I didn't want to bring in the 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 the, the, the father so mm -hmm. much, but in your point earlier that you know the because the father will be in the in the audience and I see your perspective where you mention a bit about the the the, the father role and stuff like that in there as well. So I I I, I appreciate that. Um, yeah. So it it was it was it was very good and it was very good. Well, I appreciate that. And I, one of the things, the reasons why I, I thought about this idea of the fathers, number one, you can get the fathers later the next month, right? <laughs> On Father's Day. <laughs> so there, there's that. Okay. But I did want to think about the idea. And I want, you know, this is something that we've got to think a little bit outside the box. A lot of times when we do these special sermons, uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day, whatever else, we, we've got to think about who's going to be there. A lot of dads will go because simply because it is Mama's Day, right? And so use those opportunities to talk to them. It won't hurt if they hear another sermon about what they need to be doing a month later. Amen. But and again, at this point in time, you can kind of remind the moms, the wives, hey, remember last month I got you. Now we're talking about the guys. You got to help these guys. Because again, let's let's be honest about it. When when and, and when we're talking to them about family situations like this, moms and dads need desperately to be there with their children to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we need to emphasize to them that if you're going to make that decision, you got to remember that this is a child that God has given you. So that's the reason why I did bring in some things about that, because again, if if Nothing else. Maybe some of their husbands will come on Mother's Day because the whole family's gone, but they may not come back. Here's your chance to get both of them. Okay. Somebody else. Anybody? I tell you, else? Any I tell you one of the things I like, Tommy, is the fact that you showed some of the negatives. You know, a lot of times I've heard, I remember growing up, of course, I grew up in the denominational world, but I remember some of the Mother, Mother's Day sermons I've heard, you know, through the years. You know, sometimes it makes it almost as if mom can walk on water, and that's not true. You know, you start off with Eve, and you start off with the fact of her failures. Uh, you talked about Sarah and, and Hagar, and that's, you know, that's a great contrast. Uh, you know, sometimes we, because we want to focus our, our sermons on moms, and we want everybody to think about the, you know, the, the best their mom is and has and does, but sometimes we need to stop and remind ourselves that moms are still human, and moms can you know, moms mess up just like we do and just like dads do and just like, you know, everyone else does. So I, I really like the, the part where you brought up some of the negatives to go with a lot of the, you, you, you showed a lot of positives, but you brought up enough negative to make you really stop and think that, you know, well, okay, you know, mom, mom is human. And I, I really appreciated that. Mm -hmm. Another thing I was thinking about doing in, in all of this as well as, as I was preparing this lesson, and I preached this some years ago, I wondered, you know, you don't have the three points. There was actually four or five points in here. Um, and, and again, one of the problems of preaching sometimes, as I've looked at it, is I can get on any one of those points and preach it. I mean, literally, you could actually start right now and start preaching about mom's roles and dad's roles and everything like that, going all the way up to Mother's Day and Father's Day and look at every one of those situations in a whole lot more detail rather than just hitting it, you know, like I did today. But I also emphasize the ideal, and I appreciate what you saw, Jim, is the fact that, yeah, there's good mothers, there's bad mothers, just like there's good mothers and bad mothers today. Moms, you have this responsibility. Dads, you have this responsibility. And I think that's that's something that needs to be constantly stressed um, because our culture is that way. Our culture is that way right now. And they need mom and dad. So I have a, I have a something that I, that I, I was kind of watching for it uh, because you've talked about this and I was wondering how you were going to handle it. So, and I, it, it's a, 
So I'm watching your method. And there were a couple of times where I thought, oh, he's, he's about to go on a tangent. Okay. And I, it almost, it looked like you stepped, but then you brought yourself right back. So that is the skill that impressed me. I'm like, okay, that's what I have to figure out how to do that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, it was right before you made the comment. I don't know if, if you recognize it in yourself, but it was right before you made the comment about how you could preach to every one of these. Mm -hmm. But I thought that's where I want to get to mm -hmm. <laughs> where yeah. you maintain your, you maintain it, it's on. And I don't know, Tom, you have to say if, if you did or didn't, uh, but I'm like, he could have gone off on a tangent right there. He, it's like, he was about to step there and then he came right back. And I'm like, that's, that's what I want to be able to do right there. So I was watching your method. So I like how you stayed on track. You went off a little bit, but I think that was on purpose, but you didn't go too far. And I think that we should have that latitude to be able to step to the right a few steps or go to the left a few steps. Um, but where, but for me, it's like, if I'm, I haven't quite figured out how to stop myself before I realize I'm too far down the road. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. I, that's what I recognized in your method. So that was good to see for me. It was good to see. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And that's the reason why I think whenever you're doing sermons, you need to be as, uh, as um, I will send you a copy of the sermon. This sermon was actually a um, two or three page sermon. Okay. And literally, I know my weaknesses. I know where I can start chasing rabbits. You know what I'm talking about. I know <laughs> I can do that. And, right. and it has been on numerous occasions that I've gone far afield. But I will purposefully keep an eye on my lesson on paper or whatever I'm using at that point in time. And if I see myself doing that, then, I, yeah, I will make sure that I will bring it back because that might be another lesson another time whenever you've been preaching as as long as, long as i have especially at just one congregation uh, sometimes you have the nasty tendency to think well i could just resurrect an old sermon you may have had a bad week you may have had to do funerals you may have had to do a wedding you may have been over to the hospital seeing a bunch of people and you haven't had the time. And some of you, again, you're working another job. So now you're, you're trying to do all of this and so forth. So part of the reason why it's so important that whenever we prepare the sermon is we even point out to ourselves where we can go off and try to just at that moment in time, Realize, okay, I can chase this rabbit, but I'm not going to because that's a whole other sermon and a whole other time. Let me do this. And so that's something that I want to just encourage all of you to do as you're, you're thinking about sermons, as you're thinking about preparing sermons. You know yourself better than I do. And again, that's the reason why I really literally in every sermon I do, I'm giving point A, point B, point C, and then I go down. If I have here on point C under Eve, I talked about Abel for a few minutes, and then I talked about Cain for a few minutes. And then what was the per main point? Everybody's going to be different, uh, even if they're raised by the same parents. So the thing is, you can start running off, and I could sit there and talk about my children. By the way, if you want to make your children angry, preach about them in the pulpit. <laughs> I'm being honest uh, with you here, okay? So, you know, I, I, I was told by a couple of times by my boys, you know, don't do that, dad. Okay. And sometimes, but I'm proud of you, but I don't want to do that. You know? Okay. If you don't want me to do that, I won't do that. You and are I, right, Tommy. You uh, are right. You are right. I, yeah. I know. Oh, yeah. I know. Yes. And again, if you talk to about your wife, you could get in trouble there too. So you've got to be careful. We don't, we don't err, you know, air laundry uh what's going on in our family to everybody out there but i think it's important for the family or the church to understand hey we are human just like everybody else and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to sin and i'm not going to treat my wife right and i'm not going to treat my children right and and so that's where all that comes in there so <clears throat> again 
I could have gone off that tangent. And all through this, I mean, you could literally, you could take every one of these people that I have suggested all the way down through here and make an entire sermon out of that. And you've got six or seven sermons here. If there was one thing that I didn't like about this was because, and this was a sermon I preached maybe 10 or 15 years ago. I don't even remember. I do try to date them uh, to where I do know, but um, most people in churches nowadays, and I was expecting some of you guys to say something, you had too many points. You had too many points. You remember I uh, bring out the idea earlier that preaching is being influenced by a lot of messages out there in the world now. Amen. And we, a lot of times hesitate to preach on certain things. A lot of times we, we want to do the, you know, uh, if you're watching CNN or Fox news, they'll break in with this breaking news story, right? And they'll tell you everything that they know about it at that moment in time. But then they may go on and on and on and on and on and on and on about it and about what caused it and all that other stuff. Well, appreciate that bit of news. But at the same time, we're always trying to come up with something sensational where everybody's going to hear us and stay with us. And that's a problem, too, sometimes in the church and sometimes as we preach. We want to make it so sensational that uh, everybody remembers it. Um, but we're also, as I said, we're in competition with the world and that's what makes preaching hard. And that's, what's making preaching even that much harder. So that's just a couple of things I was going through and I was hoping somebody would say, well, you, you talked about too many, but at the same time, you see that when I did that, I was kind of bringing them all. So there's different kinds. And hopefully I hit somebody out there in the auditorium all by every one of them, some way, somehow or another. And isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Any other thoughts there, comments, ideas? Listen, I meant what I said, critique me. Tell me how I could have done different, how I could have done better. I was just watching your method. I mean, I was looking for, <laughs> so I was picking up pointers. So, um, no, I, I, but I, I know you're saying more points, but I think that that breadth, that scope was needed in a lesson like uh, a message that you just preached. Mm -hmm. um, I could see, I, I, I see your point saying for other topics that might be, um, it might be too many, but for this, I, I think it was the right, the right breadth, the scope, uh, and what have you. Um, that's my limited comment a limited experience to be able to to rate somebody of your stature so i'll just leave it at that i appreciate the learning the, the method so thank you well i appreciate that brother and again i'm not anybody just a messenger boy just like all of us so we just got to stay on the same keel okay we're all on the same thing and and uh, the only thing is is i have done a little bit longer than probably most of y'all and by the way i learned this stuff over over the years and I've appreciated South Cobb for allowing me to stay as long as they have there. So that says a lot too. And, and, and that's also something else that I want to encourage you to think about all of you guys stay. Sometimes preachers go to preaching training school and they write up all these sermons and they get all this in their mind. And I'll make this point very, very valid. If we don't continue to study the Bible ourselves, we're going to dry up eventually. I'm going to be honest with you. Number two, let's not ever go back and pull up a sermon that we preached 10 years ago without re-looking at it. Because again, things have changed in 10 years. And people have changed in 10 years. And so while you might be able to pull something up that you preached 10 or 15 years ago, or maybe not as early, you might still be able to look at this whole thing in a whole nother way. I picture it sometimes as a <clears throat> going to a jeweler and you're buying an engagement ring and you're looking at all these different rings 
for this woman that you love, that you're going to spend the rest of your life with. And they're sitting there telling you, okay, you need to buy this ring. Well, it's got this huge diamond on it. Okay. How can I tell the difference between glass and, and, and a real diamond or not? You know, the price. Okay. <laughs> okay. You know that. I know that. But they may be sitting there saying, okay. So I'm going to look that thing up one side and down the other. Whenever <clears throat> my wife and I did it, I took her. I said, Are you going to marry me? She said, yeah. I said, good. You pick out the ring. <laughs> this is your ring. <laughs> you pick out the ring. I will pay for it. I don't care how long it takes me. If it takes me the rest of my life, I'll, I'll pay for it. But you pick out the ring. You see, by doing that, she got exactly what she wanted. She's happy with it. And it's not some something that's gaudy. Now, how do you do this back with the ideal of the church? The church has, you're, you're telling the church you're going to be married to Christ. You have an engagement ring. So you need to know all that you can about what? Your husband. You need to know all you can about the kind of man or the kind of person that he is. When you think about God and you think about Jesus Christ and, and so things like that. So that necessarily means that the only place you're going to be able to find out is scripture. So let's get into the scripture and see what it's going to take. So all of these things come into play there. All of those things come into play. And again, think outside the box a little bit. Think outside the ideas along that line and, and go from there. So that's look at it four or five different ways. And the more you look at it, the more you'll see. Try to put yourself in a woman's place hard. Yeah. But how will, how will my wife accept this? I've had my wife read my sermons before and tell me what I need to do and how to change it or how to make it better. There's nothing wrong with that, but you're preaching your wife's sermon. No, I'm not preaching my wife's sermon. It is both of our sermon in the fact that what I'm the one that's going to, she's going to preach it and deliver it. But what? She's given me some advice before that I, you know, and, and afterwards, all of us ask our wives later, how do you feel about that? Well, it was okay. All right. How can I go from okay to better? And your wife is going to be more honest with you than anybody else in the congregation. Amen. Amen. That's it. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong about doing that. A lot of times that will help you to become a better preacher. And that's the goal. God gave us our wives for a reason. Let's let's rejoice in me. Don't you think they want us to do that? I think so. I think so. And I think, uh, you know, again, in the Lord's church, sometimes we sit there and think, well, you know, women can't do anything. And, uh, of course, we know better. You know, when it comes to meals and stuff like that, if it weren't for the women, we wouldn't have those fellowship meals. Cereal. Uh, cereal, yeah. Milk and how cereal. Many, how many folks going to come back to the fellowship meal if all we eat cereal, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> so, so the thing is, you know, especially you seek that. You know, there have been times whenever my children were still at home, I'd ask them about some things from a perspective of a teenager. Okay. Now, they'll be brutally honest, too, if you let them. Sometimes they may be afraid of hurting your feelings, but at the same time, hey, let's be honest here. Who's going to who's going to help us better than, than anybody else? It's going to be our family, right? So, yeah, I run stuff by them. I, I've done that on numerous occasions. I've let my wife read the sermon before I stood up there, and she's given me some advice. And um, so I try to look at it from that viewpoint. And again, that's part of what preparation and delivery of sermons is. How is sister so-and-so going to take this? How is that teenager back there in the back that I can't ever get the attention? How is he going to listen to this? That's the kind of thing we need to be constantly thinking about. And if I actually put some points in there that I know will touch those people's lives, then who knows who other people that they're touching. So when we think about the idea of preparation and delivery of sermons, you're, you're, you should be thinking about certain people, not how you're going to uh, 
<clears throat> cut them off at the knees with this God doctrine, no, but you're trying to say, okay, what can I help that brother or that sister to do to be better? That's what it's about. And again, the only person that can really help them is Jesus Christ, but you, we just got to show them how. We just got to show them how. And that's really the challenge of preaching. Because like I said, and started off this whole class tonight, it's the idea of what? Every time you've got people coming to church, you don't know what happened to them this last week at work, at school. You don't know what burdens they're bearing when they're coming in there. You can see some of them coming in and they got a smile on their face and joy in their heart. And you know, it seems like, okay, they're okay. Everything's going to be all right. But sometimes people are very good at hiding that stuff, aren't they? So a lot of times we may not be able to help them if we don't know what's going on in their lives. Then some people won't tell us because they're afraid we will stand up and preach about it. And everybody will know <clears throat> that I'm talking to that particular person. But if that particular person has a problem, another person's going to have a problem. Was Jesus pointed in some of his sermons? Yes, was he pointed enough to tell, what do you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites? That's pretty pointed. Any way you want to get it, right? <clears throat> and that's what caused them to finally say, enough's enough. We got to get rid of this guy. So I think there's some things that we need to do. And I've actually had people come up and said, were you thinking about me when you prepared that? And I just smile at them real big and say, well, <laughs> sister or brother, um, it wasn't just you. There's some other folks here that's got some of the same issues that you've got that I've got. So obviously, more people need to hear it than what you think. So I just challenge this as we're preparing these sermons. We've got to know the people. We've got to know what's going on in their lives. We've got to understand what's, what, what are they feeling right now in a world right now that's just literally topsy-turvy and upside down from what it was three, four years ago, right? We've got to give them hope somewhere. And that's only in Christ, not in me, but in Christ. So, and then we need to be emphasizing to our parents, you got kids and they're growing up in a whole totally different culture than we grew up in, right? I mean, let's be honest. I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, all right? My culture is totally different than theirs now. Because if you'd have told me whenever I was 17 that I'd use computers to prepare sermons, I'd have said, you crazy. You don't even know what in the world you're talking about. Because at that time, it was the, you know, punch cards and everything like that. I said, no way in the world am I going to do that. And now our kids do all of that stuff on their phone. So we've got to, again, as we're talking to our teenagers, we've got to think about them and say, okay, use stuff that you find on the internet, but point them to some good stuff, right? Instead of the other junk that's out there. All right. <clears throat> this is, again, this is what makes it interesting. Another thing that I come into play here, and I'm going to probably try to end this class a little early tonight for that reason, okay? But I just want you to think about the idea. We don't know all the people this problems and they've got. We've got our own problems that we're struggling with. They're listening to a bunch of stuff on television that's not true. <clears throat> that is silently, Satan is there working behind the scenes to try to get them to buy into this philosophy rather than what God says. By the way, that nothing's changed from the Garden of Eden, has it? Not really. But we've just got more challenges now to try to do it. And to me, one of the biggest, most important things we need to be doing is to making the application to all of their lives whenever we're preparing that. Thinking specifically about specific people in our minds that they could use at that moment in time without naming their name. <laughs> you know? And reminding ourselves, what? If one person's got it, there's probably going to be two or three or four others that's got some of these qu same questions, same ideas, same thoughts. So, 
I think right now, again, at Mother's Day, going back to what I was doing and the lessons that I preached and so forth, I think this would be a good time to emphasize family and remind families, moms and dads, while you've got those kids at home, here's your chance. You're going to win them to Christ by your example right now or not. You could be like Adam and Eve, blow it for them, bring sin into the world, bring sin into your family. You could be like Mary, who submitted to the Lord, even though, and again, we don't know how old Mary was whenever she was found with, to be with child. Some people say 17. I don't read anywhere in the Bible. It tells us how old she was. But she may have been a young lady struggling. Says a lot about Joseph too, don't it? How he stepped up to the plate and did what he needed to do. Though he had to be convinced, right? <clears throat> and we have the Savior as a result. Any other thoughts or comments? Brother T, in your, in your, in your message, even though you might think it was um, too much, there was too much points in there, I, I think I think it was okay in, along that line um, because each of those different eras have different um, needs or cover different needs or point out different things. And I particularly like when you mentioned about um, Abraham and, and Sarah where she tried to help God because a lot of times as parents raising our child, we try to help God. You mm -hmm. know, and 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 only creating more harm than good. So I, I I particularly like that point as well. I appreciate that, brother, because again, you know, it's stuff like this, true or false. As preachers, sometimes we feel like we are the we we have the responsibility of preaching God's word. Yes, but sometimes, do you ever feel like that you're the only one that's getting it? And more than that. Do you feel like that the word is not really getting on their hearts? Do you feel like sometimes that uh, that it's just not getting there? Years ago, and here's what I, I think happened, and I think I've shared this with you before, but years ago, we were going through preachers like sand through an hourglass. Um, and the thing is, is that you'd have preachers changing every two or three years, going from one congregation to another. Some of them had to do it because they couldn't make it on whatever the, the small church was able to pay them. Some of them had to go out and find other jobs. Um, so the bottom line is they would switch around churches. And then what happened after two or three years, um, if the preacher isn't continuing to grow, then sometimes the churches will let him go so they can hear somebody else. In that time frame, I think I've mentioned this to you before, when you first start a work, you start off with simple, basic stuff. But the longer you're at a place, sometimes you don't go back over those very basic fundamental things that need to be taught. The husband's role, the wife's role, the children's role in a home what the church is. Sometimes we think that they already know all of that because they heard it all those years, but sometimes we forget, right? So I don't think it's wrong necessarily to re-preach a sermon that we've done years ago, but we do need to bring it up to date. We need to bring it up to date to the point to where it's affecting or, or dealing with the situation that we're talking about right then and there. And <clears throat> So don't don't automatically just say that's it. You know, we're, I'm not going to preach any other sermon again, or I'm not going to try to, or I'm going to keep trying to change it. We can't change it all the time, but we do need to adapt it, depending on what's going on in the world at this moment in time. So I think that's very important. I'm not saying that's wrong to re-preach a sermon. I am saying that if you do decide to re-preach a sermon, read through it and bring it up to date. Amen.
Amen. I'm, I'm, I'm not only up to date, brother, but uh, the fact that you 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 might have grown mm -hmm. spiritually, and then your the material that you present ten years ago, you, it might not be as developed as you as you know when you look back at it, you said, oh, I can develop this more, and then you develop it more as you grow. So as you grow, you can change it and 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 tweak it. Mm -hmm. to become a better one. And that's a that's a very important thing. We can't stop studying, right? We cannot sit back and say, well, I know all there is to know. And the moment we say that, we've what we've already rung the death nail of our of our preaching. I have been preaching for 42 years. And the bottom line is, is I have not stopped trying to study. Um, and the moment we stop studying, we may as well quit. We may as well quit. So that's why that's so important. All right. Any other comments, questions, thoughts, ideas? All right. Tom, you want Okay, go ahead. Something I did several years ago was I had a situation that I was dealing with. And I preached a sermon that Sunday morning on that topic. Mm -hmm. And then I responded to the invitation. And I had a brother come and hold it, have a prayer for me on my behalf. Mm -hmm. And I actually had someone come up to me and say, well, I've never seen a preacher respond to his own invitation, you know, his own invitation. <laughs> I said, well, I said, this is, this is the sermon I needed to hear this morning. And it's, and it's the sermon I needed to respond to. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes, you know, we have to be careful that people don't put us on a pedestal to the point where, or an elder either, you know, to the point where, well, you know, they don't understand my problems. They don't understand, you know, they, you know, they're, they're the preacher. They're, they're the elders. They, they really don't, I don't want to talk to them because they really don't understand. Again, like we talked about with, with the mothers and the negative side that you talked about earlier with the mothers, you know, they're still human. Preachers and elders are still human. You know, we still have our issues just like everybody else. And sometimes it doesn't hurt us to let the congregation know that. So just thought I'd share that. Amen. Amen. Okay. Anybody got else? Any else thing else? I appreciate all this. I really do. Well, this is, um, <laughs> I don't know if Jim Gentry is going to know this one or not, but uh, I I originally grew up Southern Baptist, and um, I remember that the deacons would get together right, right before between Bible class time and, and the church the lesson. Uh, the deacons would get together, and they would all they would draw straws to see who was going to go forward. Uh, so the preacher wouldn't be singing just as I am a whole other round of ten verses. And I thought that was the funniest thing I'd ever heard in my life, but they, but, uh, they did, they, they would draw straws to see who would, <laughs> they would do that. So, uh, anyhow, that's just a funny story. Wow, from that. that's, that's the first time I've heard that. I mean, you know, but yeah, yeah. I, re uh, I remember the, the, the Southern Baptist church that I grew up in and I remember the preacher, he would stand, he would it almost became a challenge as to who was going down first because it, we knew that unless somebody went down, he was going to keep having the, the choir director, you know, keep singing sing verses. Yeah, keep sing, singing it. Yeah. Keep it there's, going. There's, cause his, I know there's somebody was, out there. That, there, there. There it is right there. Somebody's <laughs> out there, and I know they need to respond. Well, at that point, oh, it's my. like somebody please respond so we can, you know, we can stop this. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, it's, and, it's a sh and it's a shame that, you know, we, we can laugh about it, but it's really a shame because – yeah. Unfortunately, we've got some in the church now that almost feel that way. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so. That's right. That's right. And again, preparation and delivery of sermons help us not repeat ourselves over and over again. It'll help us not ask people to, to do it. I think, again, that's one of the things that I I did years ago is I, I, I kept going forward a lot of times because I always felt guilty. I, if I'm, I had a mom that I, I loved her dearly and all, but she can make me feel guilty about the little thing. And I, you know, so all my wife has to do sometimes just give me that look. And I'm like, okay, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm trying to say there. <laughs> and the thing is, is that's, yeah, that's a, that's a real, that's a real thing to think about. I mean, it is. We're not there to see how many people is going to come forward. We're there to, to preach the gospel and God's not going to hold us accountable. He's not going to 
I don't think God is going to have a record book up there in heaven, though he might, where on this Sunday, so many people responded. On this Sunday, though, many, I don't think he's going to do that. I don't think he's going to do that at all. He's going to judge us from our hearts. And we won't have to say anything on that day. You know, he's already, he's already, those what the judgment call is going to be. So and isn't that the that. sad thing, brother Tommy, isn't that the sad thing? You give the message and they hear it. Mm -hmm. And the, the warning is going to be, or the, the word is going to be on the other side. You heard well, this message your whole life and you didn't respond. Or maybe you heard it three or four times and you didn't respond. That's where I think it's going to get them. Not, not the messenger side so much, but it's like, and that's why I think it goes back to your point about <clears throat> taking it so seriously. Mm -hmm. What we are preaching is not, I mean, what we're giving and as a messenger boy, uh, it's the best, it is the message period. Um, and that's why we need to do everything we can to do it right and do it the best way we can. Uh, so that when they do hear it, they'll, they'll, they'll think about it, plant the seed, you know, let it germinate a while. Maybe right. that's what it takes, but um, right. anyhow. And I think again, you know, as we continue to talk about this whole idea of the delivery of sermons, we have to think about the idea of all that week that I'm preparing. I'm thinking about me. I'm thinking about what God's saying to me at that moment in time through the word. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there repenting and saying, Lord, you know, okay, I, I'm not where I need to be on this one and so forth. I think as well in, in that respect, when it comes to especially the invitation, we need to encourage, but we don't need to be, be, be begging people to come up there. If we do that, if it goes back to the situation that you were talking about in the Baptist church or who's going to go forward just so the preacher will, you know, shut up we've already got something wrong there yeah because it's not god in the situation it's what are we gonna to have to do to get the preacher to shut up and <clears throat> i don't believe in making a long invitation i don't believe in making a long uh i, I try to tell people what they need to do to be saved but mo let's also be honest i also look out at the congregation when i'm there and, and if everybody there has been there for two or three years they know what I, they know what they need to do just as well as I do. So why do I need to keep on emphasizing that? You know, Tommy, sometimes we need to stop and remind ourselves, you know, in John six, when Jesus had preached and, you know, a lot of them left and mm -hmm. he turns around and looks at the disciples and said, are you leaving too? You notice he, he turned around and talked to them. He didn't, he didn't chase people down the street. And I sometimes wonder if we don't think we, you know, we have the feeling that, you know, well, if somebody's not responding, we got to chase them down the street. Nope. Like you said, we give, we give them the message and that, you know, if that was, if that's the way the Lord handled it, then that's good enough for us. So that's right. And that's what we've got to remember. So if we're preaching God's word, not my word, but God's word, then it's on God, you know, they've got the responsibility and there ain't no need of singing through the invitation song six or seven times. There's no need in that. It's up to them. And it may very well be that they may go home and have a nice long chit chat with God about what they've done wrong. And it may be, that may be all it needs to be because you confess it as what, as far as it's known, right? So is there anything wrong with asking people to come forward and ask for prayers? Absolutely not. We need to be doing that. Should we be encouraging people to be baptized into Christ? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I don't know that we need to repeat that every time unless we see a visitor there that maybe this may be the first time they hear something like that. But if not, then say, okay, we're, we're the invitation's open. If you need to come and confess, you need prayers of the congregation, come on. And, 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 and not go through the whole plan of salvation like we often do, right? Because everybody expects the preacher to go through the plan of salvation during the conclusion. But it's... Did Jesus offer a conclusion in their circumstance? No, he, he just said, here it is, guys. What are you going to do with it? And maybe we need to learn a lot more about that from Jesus preaching in that respect. So, um, <clears throat> well, like I said, I'm going to probably end up a little bit early tonight. Is that going to be all right with y'all? Y'all going to feel like you've been cheated anyway? Not cheated. 
<laughs> all right, this is what I want you to do. All right, we've we've all kind of we've all given a sermon up to this point in time. Now let's try to go down a different road here, and um, let's talk about uh, Bible classes versus sermons. What we're trying to do in those situations, and next week we'll sit down and say, okay. Uh, whenever I do Bible classes, I'm looking at it more from the viewpoint of the response that I will get in the in the class itself from the people. So when we're thinking about preaching, a lot of times we're thinking about yes, that, but are we not in the same, same sense as we're teaching a Bible? What's the difference between teaching and preaching? Let me ask that question. What are your thoughts? Well, it's usually that preaching is one sided. And whereas Bible class is more, you can make it more, or it's, it, it can be more interactive if you've got congreg you know, they're able to ask questions. I, a lot of times with preaching, you know, the questions can only come after, and it's all said and done. And so uh, to me, that's always been the biggest uh, difference between preaching and teaching. All right, let me ask you this then, if that's the case, as Jesus was teaching and preaching, Go through the accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and see those events where Jesus was preaching. And then you'd have the Pharisees and the scribes and so forth mm -hmm. interacting with it. And that mm -hmm. wasn't teaching then or preaching. I think he was doing both. Yeah. And I think he would not have had a, a problem with it. Now, I think, again, the reason why we kind of look at the difference between teaching and preaching is exactly what you're saying in the fact that... <coughs> When we're teaching, we're going to ask questions and expect the congregation or expect whoever's in the Bible class to respond, right? We're going to try to get them engaged in it. Yep. Whereas preaching is just the preacher and everybody's trying to listen. Okay. I want to emphasize the idea clearly that the Bible is very clear when it comes to this. We do have the Bible class situations where there's women present at least then they can, in a Bible class situation, right. say something that might challenge all of us in, in a Bible class situation, whereas they can't do that in a preaching situation. So we do understand the difference between those two and, and understand that, that God kind of set parameters on that. We don't necessarily want a woman standing up preaching in, in that circumstance, obviously. And sometimes... And I've actually seen this happen in Bible classes. A woman will get in there and she will while try to try to preach or teach. And, and we've got to be careful about even in those, those, those situations, right? Um, so the thing I'm, I'm challenging us to do is think about, to me, whenever I'm teaching, it's more, well, I'm teaching the teenagers on Sunday morning. And I've been teaching, or last night I taught, um, the adult Bible class last night on kind of recapping some of the things we talked about in Leviticus. So the thing is, is that we still had interaction between the women and the men asking questions, getting answers. I think that more people that are engaged, the better off it is. I'm off made to wonder sometimes and by the way, I don't know how you do it in the congregations you go with, but I, I give out everybody a piece of paper with blanks in it for them to fill in when I'm preaching. And by doing that, then they are still being engaged, even though they may not uh, talk to me through this lesson. Um, and so I think there is a difference between teaching and preaching. I want, to, I want everybody to understand that, because otherwise you can open the door to something that God never intended to happen. So we've got to be very careful about that. But one of the, one of the things I do, Tommy, is I put it on the back page of our bulletin. We have a four page fold over bulletin and on the back page, I'll put the, I'll put the outline. And like you say, I'll either put a question there or I'll put a place for a blank that has to be filled in or a place to put a verse or something. But like you say, that way it sort of keeps them involved and keeps them engaged. That's, that's great. That's a great suggestion that you just made. Yes. I think that's what needs to happen. I, we, we do a bulletin, and ours has been a, a ledger size paper, 
but then we went down to an eight and a half by 14. So you can't really get all the stuff that they need to know in the bulletin. Plus have a, something on the back of the page where they could fill it in. It's just not enough room. Uh, <laughs> I guess what I'm trying to say in all of this is the fact that there is a difference between teaching and preaching. There are some situations that you read about where Jesus was preaching and, and he got feedback. Maybe something that, that he didn't want at that moment in time, but he was always able to deal with that feedback. Maybe we need to, as preachers, think about this idea as well. Ask the church as a whole. Maybe in one of the sheets that we have, okay, one sheet will have the sermon on it. The back part of it is, how could I have made this sermon better? What could I have said different to help you to grow more, a little bit more? And take this stuff earnestly and honestly and read through it and say, okay, maybe this is something that's going to help me to be, be a better preacher in that respect. I think that's something that we need to consider. We don't need to just sit and listen to everybody come in and say, good sermon. Pull them aside. What would made it so good? What didn't you like about it? I'm trying to be better. That's the reason why I'm asking these questions. Not because I'm seeking for more praise, but I'm trying to be better. And again, you're going to get different answers from different age groups. So I think that, that needs to come into play. So <clears throat> what we want to do next week, as, as I'm thinking this thing through a little bit more, is um, let's everybody bring another sermon. Different subject. You choose the topic. You choose whatever you want to. And then bring us a sermon and then be willing to tell us why you thought that that sermon was a very important sermon or how you felt about that sermon. And then what we're going to try to do over the next few weeks is start talking about, okay, how do you preach a funeral? By the way, how many of you preach funerals? One. Okay. I can't count as many as I've preached. Okay. Uh, Brother Wilson, how about me? How many, how many have you preached? Zero. Zero. Maybe we need no. to talk about funerals first. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I've been preached. to many funerals, but I've not preached any funerals now. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> I've preached a bunch of them, Tommy. Well, I have too. Like I yeah, said, I know you have. Yeah. Uh, because I worked at funeral homes as well as sermons. So yeah, I have. Yeah. So let, let's just, con let, let's, we'll do that then. Go ahead and bring your sermon for next week. And next week, after we get through the sermons, we'll talk about funeral sermons, how to prepare them, what we got to do. And uh, Jim, you helped me teach the class here in this respect. All right. Um, and then we'll also talk about how to do weddings. Anybody here done weddings besides me? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Nobody. Done a bunch of them. Done a bunch of them. Okay. I, yeah. I've done a few as well. <clears throat> I'll close this lesson out tonight with my favorite saying at the end of every wedding. <laughs> this is going to be good. I can tell. <laughs> uh, at the end of it, I look at them and I'm smiling real big and I'm saying, I now pronounce you man and wife. And then I'll say to the husband, Sean, you may now kiss, kiss the bride, but please do keep it dignified. <laughs> <laughs> and man they're looking at me like huh <laughs> you didn't tell, you didn't go over that whenever we did this 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 other thing here <laughs> and you should see the it's like really <laughs> did you just say that <laughs> i have fun you know what i'm saying i have fun yeah. dealing with some of that stuff but yeah yeah all right so bring your sermon next week <clears throat> and <clears throat> be really ready to prepare it. Or, and it's just on any topic you want to, any sermon you want to, we'll start talking about funerals and what's got to do there in that respect, how you can, uh, how we can help you out in that respect. And uh, then we'll start talking about also weddings. And then we'll just kind of get back and look at all of those things together and just come back to what we're doing. All right. Excellent. Thank, Thank you guys. Appreciate you so much. And uh, you too, brother. Oh, I, I appreciate all of you guys. And I hope we're learning something from one another. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Thank you, brother. Take care. Bye -bye. Yes, sir. Hey, and brother, have a safe trip back home. All right. Will do. Yeah, Thank you. you. All right. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.